This week on Personally Speaking, our guest is the great Catholic journalist, Rick Hinshaw. Please stay with us. Hello and welcome to Personally Speaking. I'm your host, Monsignor Jim Lasanti, and Rick Henshaw joins me now. Rick has spent more than 30 years in Catholic communications work as a reporter, a news editor, a columnist, and for eight years editor of the Long Island Catholic. Rick was director of communications for the Catholic League and associate director of communications at the New York State Catholic Conference. Rick also has a long history of pro-life leadership, which includes being the founder and first president of Long Island Youth for Life and Justice. Rick has been very active in politics and government on Long Island as a state assembly candidate and later assembly district leader and then state committee member of the New York State Conservative Party. Rick is currently the author of his own blog site, Rick Hinshaw, Reading the Signs. He's also a religion writer for Newsmax magazine and a contributor to the opinion section of Newsmax online. More importantly, Rick has been married to his wonderful wife, Eileen, for 36 years, and they are the very proud parents of three adult children, Claire, Raymond, and Joseph. He's here with us today to talk about his life, his family, his Catholic faith, which are all an important part of his life and work. Joining me now, I'm so pleased to welcome to Personally Speaking, Rick Henshaw. Rick, thanks for coming on our program. Good to be with you again, Monsignor. Rick, you know, there are many, many topics I want to cover today, but um, the one that's most personal and most pressing, your brother John and a number of other wonderful people like Joan Andrews Bell are in jail right now because of a law called FACE, uh, instituted first by Bill Clinton and uh, really enforced now under the Biden administration that's put uh, innocent protesters in jail. Um, Very much a, a real violation of that long history of civil disobedience in our country. First of all, what did John do to get himself into jail, and, and what is the import of FACE, and, and why do we still have a law that puts people who haven't hurt anybody in jail, when you and I both know on the streets of New York, lots of people hurt lots of other people and never go to jail? Yeah, not only that, but, but you know, following Dobbs, we know all of the scores of violent attacks on pro-life pregnancy centers, vandalism against Catholic churches, directly related to the to the pro-abortion uh, uh, movement, and yet, virtually, as Ted Cruz pointed out, when these rescuers were convicted, virtually nothing done by the Department of Justice against those violent pro-abortion activists. Uh, yes, yeah, so what John and and uh, eight others did, uh, they 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 had a group down there in Washington, a group calling itself the. Uh, uh, progressive anti-abortion uprising. They're really a kind of a left-wing pro-life group. Uh, they're active against the death penalty and on climate change, but they are also uh, consistently concerned about protecting human life and, and they're pro-life. And they've had their eye on this uh, late-term abortionist, Cesare Santangelo, down in, in D.C. Uh, and they believe he's breaking uh, two federal laws, at least, uh, doing late-term partial birth abortions, and they have them on videotape, an undercover video by the group Live Action, stating that if babies are born alive at at his abortion mill uh, following a failed abortion, he will not do what the law requires to try to keep the babies alive. Now, those are two federal laws that should still be enforced. The yeah. base law, freedom of access to clinic entrances, as you said, passed during the Clinton years to protect a woman's access to her constitutional right to abortion. Mm-hmm. Well, following yeah. jobs, there is no constitutional right to abortion. So hopefully in the appeals yeah. process, that's going to be part of the case. But but what this group and, and John and John Andrews Bell uh, decided to do to try to dramatize what was happening there was a rescue in which they entered the abortion clinic. John, of course, was a one of the leaders of Operation Rescue back in the late 80s and mm-hmm. hadn't done it for years, but 
felt this this needed to be dramatized. So they went inside, they sat in, they prayed, uh, and they were arrested for it. Uh, but with the face law, the whole purpose of that is to to enable very draconian sentences. You know, I saw Chris Bell on one of your previous shows saying that during the rescue days, trespassing or obstruction would be a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months in jail. Mm -hmm. uh, what they're facing now is up to 11 years in prison because they were convicted of obstruction, which under face is up to a year in prison. And then they were convicted of conspiracy, which seems to be a catch-all charge with this weaponized FBI. And mm -hmm. that could uh, give them up to 10 years in prison. Now, the interesting thing here, Monsignor, is that uh, a year and a half after they did the rescue, and they were arrested and charged by local authorities, and John told me the FBI questioned them at the time, but no federal charges were forthcoming. Then two women, including one of them who was arrested here, Lauren Handy, uh, came in possession of a box of trash being disposed of by Sant'Angelo's clinic. When they opened it, they found the remains of 115 aborted babies. Wow. Most of them they arranged for proper burial. Five of them clearly late term or full term, and the pictures have been published by them in live action at Harvard. You know, I've been involved in this movement for 50 years now, uh, and this shocked and, and appalled me. And when they called authorities, these two women, asking them to pick up these remains and use them, do autopsies, use them to investigate whether Santangelo was breaking the laws. Instead of doing that, the very next morning, the FBI swooped in and arrested these nine rescuers from a rescue a year and a half before, including John up here on Long Island. And he said when the FBI banged on his door in the pre-dawn hours, when he opened the door, one of them had the battering ram ready to break wow. in the door if he hadn't. So uh, they were, that's why they were arrested. They were convicted on the obstruction and conspiracy. The judge, uh, Judge Kolar Catelli, a federal district court judge, uh, their lawyers had assured them they, they were free before trial. Their lawyer, lawyers assured them they would be free pending sentencing after trial, able to go home spend time with their families, get their affairs in order. Instead, the judge declared that these were violent actions and clapped them right into prison from uh, their conviction back in September. Uh, they've been in prison ever since. The sentencing is not scheduled till May, so they'll be in prison for eight or nine months before they're even sentenced. The final thing I'd like to bring up about this, just a couple of weeks ago, one of the Thomas More Society lawyers who are representing some of these defendants said that he got a call from the Washington Medical Examiner telling him that the Department of Justice had contacted them, telling them there's no more reason to uh, keep these babies' bodies any longer. So they were going to be disposed of. Uh, the lawyer blew the whistle and, and the, the conservative online site Daily Signal, which has been following this case all along, picked right up on it. That led a number of people in Congress, uh, Senator Ted Cruz, Congressman Chip Roy of Texas, Congressman Chris Smith, and uh, 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 scores of others to speak out and demand that these bodies not be destroyed. And Ted Cruz pointed out these bodies are evidence the judge in this case would not allow them to present that evidence to show the pictures of these babies, to play the video of Santangelo saying he wouldn't treat babies born alive. Uh, but they hope on appeal to be able to use this evidence. And so Ted Cruz let them know that there would be hearings immediately and they'd be called before Congress if they allowed these babies to be destroyed. So they have okay. it off on that for now. Uh, okay, Rick, Rick, let me interrupt you for a second, and I appreciate sure. that, that overview, but uh, even for a very basic understanding, for our listeners, F-A-C-E stands for what? Freedom of access to clinic entrances. Okay, so now, any attempt to sit in or in any way block the, the entrances falls under this law. Okay, now, um, so it's instituted under President Bill Clinton. I'm presuming there is not very strong enforcement during the time of President George uh, W. Bush, as uh, certainly no, no real uh, um, imposition of this particular severe penalty under President Trump. 
What about during the Obama years? Is 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 the Biden administration even further left than Obama? Well, on this, it seems that they are. On the other hand, following the passage of the FACE Act, that was probably one of the reasons. But for a number of reasons, the the, the organized rescue movement really kind of died out uh, for mm -hmm. a while. There may have been isolated incidents, but uh, certainly I don't know of any enforcement of the FACE law uh, against pro-life uh, protesters before the Biden administration. They certainly... Uh, yes, they're they're going much much harder against uh, pro life activists than any previous administration has. Rick Hinshaw is our guest. Rick, uh, with your background in journalism, I wanted to ask this because one of the things I mentioned to our listeners and viewers was uh, your editorship of the Long Island Catholic. One of the ways we get the message out about things like the injustices of face and the Biden administration would be to use the Catholic press. But you know and I know that so many strong arms of the Catholic press seem to have died off. So the Long Island Catholic, unfortunately, is gone. Uh, Catholic New York, wonderful newspaper, gone. And many, many other Catholic journals and means of getting the word out. Uh, as a guy who's been involved much of his life in Catholic journalism, uh, why, why have our instruments died out? And what do we do to keep the word out there? Yeah, well, in terms of why they've died out, I, I think... Uh, there's there I, I what i saw as i was <laughs> trying to save the long island catholic as editor is that there is a short sightedness and an oversimplification you know the argument was constantly put forward to me that you know people don't read newspapers anymore that you know mm. we really have to go to uh, digital media what we were trying to do at that time at the long island catholic was do both what i wanted to do was to make our, our Long Island Catholic website a kind of a breaking news website. And mm -hmm. then the weekly paper would flesh out in more detail uh, what we were reporting on a day-to-day -day basis. And we did a little of that, but you need you need the, the resources, you need the personnel to do that. And they were constantly cutting my staff. I had less and less people, so I didn't have the people to do that everyday kind of coverage. But that would have been a way. And then if ultimately you found that there was not, you know, enough readership of the of the uh, physical printed paper, you would have already been in the process of transitioning. So people would have been used to going to the website. Uh, that didn't happen. And the other thing is, you know, I thought what we got from Catholic readers and from people throughout the diocese was when we covered things, it brought people in. When people had an event and it was publicized in Long Island Catholic, they said, oh, we got calls right after it was in the paper. People right. wanted to right. sign up on charitable things. Oh, we got more donations. Our readership might have been declining, but it was still there among faithful Catholics, Catholics mm -hmm. that were active. And it seemed like when people read things in our paper, they responded. Rick Barnes at the Catholic Conference in those days told me when we put out an alert on legislation, he said, we get more letters coming through us to the legislators from Long Island than anywhere else. He said, that's because you're highlighting those issues. Uh, so it was vital. And the, the other major thing I think, Monsignor, that's been lost is the connectedness that the Long Island Catholic, that any good diocesan newspaper should create throughout the diocese that people from different areas, different parishes would say, Oh, yeah, I read about what you're doing in the Long Island Catholic. You know, now I know, you know, Monsignor Jim Vaughn does a, a, as good of a job as can be done with that on telecare. But when you had that, you know, the broadcast media, the printed media, and hopefully a growing online media, there was more and more of that. So I think today, you know, there's been a there's been a, a, a give up on that. And, and certainly a lot of it was a financial retrenchment as well, unfortunately, especially with with, the, you know, the uh, anticipation in New York that the child victims law was eventually going to pass, which it did, which created so much expense because of the the abuse scandal. But I think there would have been ways of continuing. I propose different ways where we could save money and still have a paper. But the mindset seemed to be at that point, no, we're, we're going to do away with it. They went to a, a monthly magazine and a couple of years ago they did away with that because that just did not fill, I don't think, for most people the need. I had one pastor say to me when I was editing the magazine before I left, 
uh, he said, you know, the magazine will be a good supplement to mm. the weekly paper because you're able to do more in-depth features there. He said, but it doesn't give the ongoing news, the up-to-date, urgent news that, that people need. So today, I mean, there does have to be a stronger digital effort, obviously. But I think, you know, I think the Brooklyn Diocese, and I, I had the privilege to do a little work for them shortly after I retired, uh, and they're the sales media combines things very well they still have a weekly paper with the brooklyn tablet they have an excellent website they do a terrific nightly news program mm -hmm. so they combine it all but they have obviously decided that it's worth investing resources in and i i i think that would be the case out here too but i don't know now with the financial constraints whether there will ever be a chance to go back to print as one leg of a of a uh, a widespread media approach. Our guest in person right. is Rick right. Henshaw. Rick, you know that uh, you mentioned it. That's why I want to follow up on it. As a guy who has lived faithfully in the church and practices his faith and takes seriously the church, I'm wondering, what was your reaction years ago to the news of the depth of the scandals? And do you have any idea, as a man who has dealt with the public in many, many different places, how are we supposed to find our way back? I've mentioned before in this program that at pre cana we have one of the largest pre canas in the diocese, and inevitably the issue comes up of, as a reason for why young people might not go to church because they're so appalled by the scandal, which is perfectly fine. They should be. But you, as a man who has remained faithful, but probably disgusted by some parts of the scandal, how did you handle your reaction to it, and also what's our way forward? Well, yeah, I mean, it was it was difficult for me as someone who, who uh, you know, has has uh, is, you know, strong in my own faith and, and also, you know, working in the church for so many years. And the, the irony for me was I had been at the Catholic conference as as communications director and had left maybe a little over a year before the scandal broke. But I left to work for Nassau District Attorney Dennis Dillon. So I was right back in the middle of the scandal again. And it was it was a horrible thing. It was upsetting. It, it was very depressing. And then part of the fallout for it, which concerned me in years that went on, because, of course, uh, you know, those who have opposed the church all along and want to discredit the church and religious faith just jumped all over this, but mm -hmm. we couldn't complain about them doing it because we had handed it to them, not only those <laughs> behaving so terribly, but, but the church's failure to properly respond to it. Uh, but I do think over the years, there's been an effort to uh, maybe uh, expand it even further than it is with false accusations. And I think maybe the church in trying to rectify that sometimes I fear is maybe a little too quick to, I don't want to say throw under the bus, but uh, give credence maybe immediately. It made sense if a priest is accused, well, immediately take him out of service while it's investigated. But that puts an automatic stigma, and it's very difficult. To me, there's nothing more horrible than to abuse a child in that way. But mm -hmm. that means there's nothing more horrible to be falsely accused of than that kind of it. So my heart also goes out uh, to those who who are are falsely accused. And I think, you know, the church and the world could take a lesson from the case of Cardinal Pell in Australia, who it seems, and I was with the Catholic League when he was going through that, and Bill Donahue asked me to do a lot of the research on that. And I, I had no doubt, and obviously the highest court over there found unanimously that the charges were without merit, but only after that man have been imprisoned and dragged through a lot, really as a way to attack the Catholic Church and the Catholic teachings that he stood so firmly for. So it's it's very difficult. It's very painful. The thing I would say to the individual Catholic, and I've always tried to say this, is if you believe that the center of our faith is the Eucharist, and you believe that to be the body and blood of Jesus, don't give that up because of any shortcomings, no matter how awful, no matter how horrific, don't stop receiving that every Sunday, because that is still true and good. Of course, part of the problem, as you well know, is surveys over the years show fewer and fewer Catholics actually believe the Eucharist to be the body and blood of Jesus. And I think some people who may have 
believed it verbally, but never really internalized it. And so it's easy to fall away from. But that's tragic when people lose that and give up that faith because uh, of, of the, the terrible moral failings of, of some of our clergy and, and, and some of our bishops. Rick Hinshaw, is our, Rick, you know, one of the one of the topics you mentioned before, too, was your work at the Catholic Conference of New York State. And for our listeners and viewers, uh, every state has a Catholic conference that is there really to lobby on behalf of the things we believe in the public square, to let elected officials know of our point of view and why we support that point of view. Here's what I'm wondering. In states like California, in states like uh, New York, which is so overwhelmingly one party and liberal and uh, heavily Democrat, um, it's it's pushing a boulder up a hill that's going to roll back over you. But I just wonder, when you were a spokesperson for the conference, where do you find hope and not get frustrated in knowing that I have this truth that I believe to be real and true, but I know, too, that uh, the politics of the state is set against me. So I'm probably never going to see this goodness happen. Uh, how do you get up every day and go to work in light of that? Yeah, that's it's got to be very hard. I mean, when I was there, it was right around the turn of the century, and things were things were pretty difficult for us for, at that time. But we still could uh, make some progress. Generally, and not to be partisan, but at that time, we generally had a Republican majority in the state Senate, and they were at least somewhat responsive to the concerns that the bishops would raise. We we had some entree there, and of course. You know, the Catholic Conference on some issues, it finds support even in the Democratic Party when, when the conference is pushing for programs for the poor. Uh, mm -hmm. There's, uh, you know, there, there's support there. Uh, but of course, on, on things like school choice, uh, they're, they're totally opposed to uh, a choice toward Catholic schools. And of course, on, you know, on the moral issues, on the life issues, uh, marriage issues, uh, totally opposed to the church. And of course, it's worse now. And I think that too, Monsignor, started to get worse a year or two after I left, not because of me, because of the scandal. Once the scandal broke, I could see, you know, even from my vantage point in the DA's office, uh, many Republicans running from the church, running from the bishops, uh, you know, not wanting to be at all associated with anything that the church stood for then. And I think it really weakened the voices of our bishops, which I think was really a shame because I think we've had some good bishops, you know, yeah. strong yeah. in wanting to promote and defend our faith values in the public square, but they're just not listened to. So I don't know if I were up there now, I think all I would do is, you know, uh, take it to prayer and mm. let my faith sustain me in doing what's right always trying to do it as I've always tried to do in a persuasive way, not, and I, again, you know, being in the pro-life movement so long, it's easy to, to get angry at the hatred directed at us and at the church and everything. But I've always tried to say, if we try to reason with people that we can at least open some minds, you know, I'm always moved by the line in the, uh, in the hymn, here I am, Lord, I will break their hearts of stone, give yeah. them hearts of and that's what we all need to be about. And certainly for our Catholic conference, pe conference people now, Dennis Paust, who must be a very lonely leader up there right now, and, and uh, a friend of mine, he's been at it for a long time. Uh, but uh, it's got to be very difficult and very lonely up there now. And hopefully for him and his staff, they can their faith can sustain them. And hopefully our, our state's bishops, you know, help to uh to fortify right. them as well our, our guest is rick hinshaw we're talking about his experience as a, a spokesperson very often for the church and for points of view that are very catholic uh, rick you know but many people know that you did work for the catholic league for many many years and i'm reminded of the effectiveness of the jdl the jewish defense league doing something similar where they would say you know we're not going to take it if you attack our points of view or attack us personally uh, we're going to defend the Jewish community. And I think they did that often enough effectively. Certainly the Catholic League has tried to do the same thing when the church is attacked. Now, Rick, for our listeners and viewers who have probably, I hope, very much learned during this half hour, um, you also have a, a, a blog out there where you continue to try to educate and dialogue. How do our listeners and viewers uh, stay in touch with Rick Henshaw? 
Yeah, uh, if, to go to my blog site, just Google rickhenshaw.com and it will take you to my blog site, which is Rick Henshaw Reading the Signs. And through there, you can sign up to subscribe to my blog. doesn't cost anything. Just put your email address in and you'll get every blog that I write. And it has my email there too. So uh, if you want to uh, respond to me personally, uh, get in touch with me about anything, uh, certainly use my email address, which is rick.henshaw at AOL.com. And I am, you know, certainly available for, for speaking engagements or whatever as well. So, uh, yeah, I'd welcome hearing from, uh, from any of your viewers. And I thought, Rick Henshaw, that I was the only man left in America still with an AOL email address. I'm glad to have good company there. You know? I want to thank Rick Henshaw for being our guest on Personally Speaking. The man has literally decades of experience in journalism and uh, being a spokesperson for the views that we hold dear uh, working for the New York State Catholic Conference and the Catholic League and the Long Island Catholic, uh, the district attorney's office. He's a great spokesperson. One thing I would hope that our listeners picked up by watching a show like this is uh, you're, you're wonderfully nuanced, Rick, in that uh, you have a point of view, but you're uh, open to the many gray areas in life on both sides of the fence. And what a, a great culture we would have if people would more and more at least be open to the possibility of examining why other people feel as they do, and how do we come to mutual understanding? You're a great voice, not only for the church, but as a reasonable person in an unreasonable age. I thank you, Rick Hinshaw, for being with us, and uh, our love to Eileen and your great kids, and uh, thank you again for being with us. Thank you so much, Monsignor. As we end today's program, I want to thank you all for being with us. If you need to reach me, you can do that at Personally Speaking Podcast at gmail.com. Uh, we're also, you're probably listening to this on Sirius XM, the Catholic channel, but if you want to watch the program, we're on YouTube. You can search under Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti. We're also on Facebook at Personally Speaking with Monsignor Jim Lasanti and on Instagram at Personally Speaking Podcast. Please share and tell your friends and family about our program. I've been privileged to serve as host and executive producer, Personally Speaking. Our producer is Lisa Jandovitz. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll be with you again next time on Personally Speaking.